part of this faith journey is that we look out and everybody else who sees with natural eyes, by the grace of God, we see with eyes of faith. We look at a situation that is hopeless and we declare hope into a situation of hopelessness. See, God looked out at the universe when there was darkness, when the earth was without form and void and he spoke everything into existence. You are created in his image and in his likeness. And in like fashion, we are to look into the nothing and to speak and proclaim something, to speak and proclaim the goodness of God in the land of the living. Come on, is there anybody here who can testify to the goodness of God in here today? Anybody here who just knows the presence of God is real and is in your life today? I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. Of dry bones rattling. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. Right here in Oatana, yeah, I hear the sound. 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 In Nahum 1, verse 7, it says, The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. He is close to those who trust him. Let's trust God with everything. Sometimes it's real easy to trust God in certain areas of our life. Um, I know that's true for me. So, like, there's some things where it's like, yes, I trust God, I trust God. And then, but this area over here, I don't, I don't really want to trust him. That's too hard. <laughs> too much has happened. And so, but God's saying, trust me with everything. Let's trust him and believe that he can, he can, he can be there for us and that he can meet us exactly where we're, where we're at. God, I just thank you for what you're doing in people's lives. God, I thank you for touching them and meeting them exactly where they're at. God, I just pray right now that you will just touch their lives. God, that it, even in the dark secret corners of their, of their heart, God, that you will touch and bring it to light, Father. I just, I, I pray even, even if we don't know what we're not trusting God with, God, that you'll just show us. Help, help us love you even more, God. Help us trust you on every level, God. Help us not be out of our own strength, but out of your strength, God. Because, you know, we can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. We can't fix all the problems. We can't fix other people. We can only look to God and work on ourselves. And God, I just pray right now that, that you will just be with us, Father. I just pray that you will just touch our hearts. And God, we just worship you, God. We give it all to you. There is healing in worship. And if you've come here with a heavy heart, with things going on, I just pray that as we, as we sing these songs, that you will just open up to God. I can t attest to healing and worship. There have been many a times that things have happened in my life, and, and it's through worship, either corporate or by myself, both have happened. There has been healing that's happened. And, and I just want you guys to know that there's healing in worship. There's healing when we come to God and give it all to him and not, not just half of it, but all of it. And, and God will meet us there, and he will heal. Thank you, Jesus, for that. earth has quaked before moved by the sound of his voice 
eyes Seas that are shaken and stir Can be calmed and broken From my regard Through it all Through it all My eyes are on you Through it all Through it all It is well Through it all Through it all My eyes are on you It is well With me Far be it from me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Be thrown in the midst of the sea Through it all, through it all My eyes are on you Through it all, through it all It is well Through it all, through it all My eyes are on you It is well with me So let it go my soul and trust in him the waves and wind still know his name So let it go my soul and trust and we still know his name. So let go, let go, my soul, and trust in him. The waves and wind still know his name. So let go, my soul, and trust in him. The waves and wind still know
situation it is well good times and in fair with my soul it is well stories that have proved your faithfulness I've seen miracles my mind can't comprehend there is beauty in what I can't understand Jesus it's you Jesus it's you I believe the wonder I've seen too good to not believe you're the wonder working God you heal because you love the miracles will see you're too good to not believe too good to not believe too good to not believe Resurrect a man with my own hands. Just the mention of your name can raise the dead. All the glory to the only one who can. Jesus, it's you. Jesus, it's you. Tell me he can't do it. 
I've seen troubled souls delivered. I've seen addicts finally free. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. We'll see cities in revival and salvation flood the streets. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. We'll see him refill the nations like the world has never seen. Don't you tell me he can't do it, cause I know that he can. I believe the wonder working God, the wonder working God. The miracles I've seen, you're too good to not believe. You're the wonder working God, heal because you love. The miracles we'll see. To not believe, too good to not believe, too good to not believe, too good to not believe. I've seen cancer disappear, I've seen metal plates dissolve. Yes, I know that he can't do it. Yes, I know that he can do it. I've seen real life resurrection. I've seen mental health restored. Yes, I know that he can do it. Yes, I know that he can do it. I've seen families reunited. I've seen prodigals return. Yes, I know that he can do it. Yes, I know that he can do it. I've seen troubled souls to live. I've seen addicts finally free. Yes, I know that he can do it. Yes, I know that he can do it. We'll see cities in revival and salvation flood the streets. Yes, I know that he can do it. Yes, I know that he can do it. We'll see glory fill the nations like the world has never seen. Yes, I know that he can do it. Yes, I know that he can. I believe in the wonder working God. In the wonder working God. The miracles I've seen. Too good to not believe. In the wonder working God. Because you love. Oh, the miracles we'll see. Too good to not believe. I believe the wonder work in God. You're the wonder work in God. All the miracles I've seen. Too good to not believe. You're the wonder working God, and you heal because you love. Oh, the miracles we'll see. You're too good to not believe. God, I just thank you. I I thank you for how amazing that you are. And and I know, um, I know that there's some of you in here that are like singing the song or listening to the words and you're like, but God, you haven't answered my prayer. I haven't seen that miracle. And um, I just really feel like God wants me to share this, but uh, when, when my dad was sick in the hospital, we prayed like never before that he would have a miracle and he would be healed. And God took him anyways. And so we had a choice. We could either say, God, I'm mad at you, and I, don't lo- I no longer believe in miracles because you didn't do it for me, or we could believe that God is in control, and even though he took my dad from me, he still has a plan for us here, right? And, and I say that because I know that some of you have been disappointed. Some of you have had loss or, or, or other things happen where it feels like God hasn't answered your prayer. 
but God knows the beginning and the end, and we don't. And yes, sometimes hard things happen to us, and sometimes a miracle doesn't look like we think it should. But God is still on the throne, and I still see miracles. And, and I, I, even though I hate what happened, I still trust God. And that's what God wants to see from each of you. Trust him no matter what. God, I just, I just pray for each and every person here. God, I just thank you for the miracles we've seen in this room, God. The families restored, the lives transformed, Father. The addictions that have been broken, God. The healings that have happened. Sometimes we forget, but God, you've done so much. You've done so much in our lives, and I thank you for that. And God, I just pray that for those hurting people, God, that haven't seen your power, Father. I just pray that you will just show them your love and help them to trust you. Help them to trust you, God. And, and I just, I thank you so much for what you're going to do and where, we're, where you're taking us, God, and what you're preparing us for, Father. I, I, I thank you, God, for everything, Father. You are in control. You are in control. Help us believe that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, you guys are dismissed. You can go ahead and head to your classes. And um, everybody else can have a seat and say hi to someone around you. Welcome everybody to Sound Church. We're so glad that you're here. And my name is Christina and this is Judson. Hello today. And um, if this is your first time, welcome. If um, we haven't met, um, sorry, uh, if we haven't met, um, we would love to say hi to you out in the lobby after the service. Um, we've provided lovely food and refreshments. So um, come on out and say hi to us. Uh, we don't bite, I promise. <laughs> not, not often. Not too bad. And um, this is our last 10 o'clock service. So this is a big milestone, and we're very excited. Um, yeah. Some of you can come to church every week with an 8.30 service. So uh, 8.30 and 10.30 will be next week. So if you forget, because sometimes that happens, um, if you come at 10, don't worry. You'll just be in time for the 10.30 service. Isn't that exciting? That is good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, we're, we're just really excited. God, God's really moving, and he, he's, he's doing things with Sound Church, and uh, I'm just excited for what's ahead. Um, so it's going to be good. Um, we have small groups starting this week on Tuesday night at 6.30. Both small groups will be meeting here at the church at 6.30. Um, so come on out, and when you get here, you can figure out where the, yours is that you want to go to. Um, so we're excited about those. Um, and then Friday is ladies, uh, ladies' night, so um, come on out for that. Um, we are... I don't know. It's been a while, so I'm very excited. It's going to be good. So um, if, if you want to get involved in any way, bring some food or um, any kind of involvement with that, um, we have a sign-up out in the lobby. So I'd love to see more of you involved if you'd like. Um, so that's an opportunity. And then, yeah, next week, two services. Two services. What, what? Woohoo! All right. Awesome. You guys are fantastic. You're looking good today, aren't you? Yeah, you are. I can tell because I have eyes. That's, that's a good call. Also, hey, don't forget that not this week, but next week, say next week, is our next youth service, our second ever. And the first one was a big banger, so make sure you get all the people you know that are in that 6th to 12th grade range. They need to be here that Wednesday. It's going to be killer. Um, but, uh, hey, we're going to be wrapping up our series this week that we've been going through called Better. And uh, hopefully all of us are getting better as a result. That's the idea anyway. Uh, so this is our final week. And, uh, 
And so, but yeah, we had, you know, first week we did this thing called Better Is One Day, which is a, just a scripture. It wasn't my idea. Better Is One Day uh, in, in God's courts and a thousand days elsewhere. Second week, we talk about better is one handful living than two hands full of strife and chasing the wind. Third week, wisdom is better than gold, understanding better than silver. Last week, we talked about better is a good name, right? Better to have a good name. And this week, we're going to be talking about patience. Everybody's like, oh, no, patience, right? Yeah. Anybody here ever find yourself occasionally or often impatient? Anybody? Some of you couldn't wait to raise your hand because you're so impatient on that. But, um, yeah, you know, I've, I've had some impatient moments in my life. That's probably hard for you to believe, but it's true, even me. I was, I was 16 years old, and I had an 86 Caprice Classic station wagon. Anybody remember these things? Like the Brady Bunch mobile? Had the third row of seat in the back that faced backwards? That was awesome. So I could either haul a whole bunch of friends around, or what I actually did was I um, dismantled a big console stereo system. You remember those from the 60s and 70s? These console stereos where you like slide open the coffee table and put your record on the turntable, right? I took the speakers out of that and made them subs for the trunk of my station wagon. Yeah. True innovation. That was awesome. Yes. But anyway, so I was delivering pizza in Lakeville, and one sixtieth Street in Lakeville was getting remodeled or or you know redone, and that's right where the pizza shop I worked for was. Pizza and pasta it was called, and. I was cruising through, and they put a pile of dirt right in the way of the road I was supposed to turn down. And, you know, you're 16. You're, you're not smart, right? I know all us teenagers, when we're teenagers, we think we know everything, but we're, that's like the dumbest time in our life. So I was super dumb, and so I thought, well, I'm just going to go over it. And so I just, with my V8 and my Brady Bunch mo- mobile, and tried to go up over this pile of dirt. And, of course, I high-centered it. It's like teetering on the dirt. <laughs> And now I'm stuck, and the pizza's getting cold. And thankfully, some cool dudes in a Jeep were out there mudding on the, on the road. And so they came and pulled me off. Um, and then I was able to go around and deliver their cold pizza. That was really fun. Another time delivering pizza uh, was kind of in the south end of Lakeville, where it was almost Farmington, and there was a new development there. I was in the same awesome station wagon. It was tan, by the way, in case you want to really get, really get a picture in your head. Don't be jealous of my first car. I saved up, I saved up for a long time, and I spent $500 of my own money to buy it. And it is my second favorite car to this day after the Brutus, the big beast I drive now. That's my first favorite. I love that station wagon. If I could buy that station wagon, I would drive that around this town with a smile. With a smile, I tell you. Anyways, so, and I was driving pizza another day, and it was in this new development. And so normally neighborhoods had go pretty reasonable speed. I didn't want to run any kids over. But this was a new development. There was nobody who lived there. Everything was just in framing. And I was trying to get across the area. I was going a little too fast, as was my custom. And I couldn't see that beyond the street light, the road turned. And so I was faced with a split-second decision. It felt like with the momentum, if I turned hard, I might roll the car. If I tried to stop, I'd probably high center, and I had done that before. I didn't want to do that thing again. So I just rode it out. I just went, woo and launched off of the road, four-foot drop into a fully ripe cornfield. <laughs> and, like, the, all the corn stalks are going down and corn coming up over the windshield, <laughs> kind of a thing. And the car, while it was still rolling, I literally did, like, a, I'm still alive. I hammered down, whipped around in the cornfield, went back up the embankment, delivered the pizza. I did have a little bit of a noise where the fan, like the fan shroud on the bottom was pushed up into my fan, and it kind of went while the fan spun for a day or so, and then it went away. What a good car that was. <laughs> there was another time, many, many years later, I was an adult by this point, and I was living in Washington, and I was working a, an in-home sales job, and I was given a lead in the area of Quinault Indian Reservation in Washington, which is way on the Pacific Ocean coast. And back then, you didn't just pull out your smartphone and have GPS. You know, this was like the old days. So I had a laptop plugged into an inverter, plugged into the cigarette lighter, and the laptop had Microsoft Maps or Microsoft Trips and Maps. Has anybody ever heard of this before? I mean, and then you had a USB GPS antenna that I had to, like, stick to the dashboard of my blue Ford Explorer. No, Ford, what was it, Escort. Little Escort. E little bitty guy. Put it in your pocket. 
So we're cruising, I'm cruising through, and the, the, you know, Microsoft trips and streets and maps, whatever it was, it wasn't like accurate. It was like someone once said a road was there, so we'll put it there. That's how it worked. So I'm going through, and it's like I've driven like two and a half hours to get to where I am, and I'm only 12 miles away, and the pavement ends. And I thought, well, that's okay. This is a durable little Ford Escort. I'm just going to go on the dirt road. So I start going on the dirt road. Then the dirt road, there's more and more trees growing up around it. Then there's like the trees are kind of covering the road. Then there's like a log going across the road, and I snuck under it with my cute little Escort. And then and I keep going, and the road keeps getting worse. Next thing you know, I'm kind of going down this little embankment, and it kind of is getting a little muddy. And at the bottom, there's a little bridge that crosses a river. But this bridge isn't like the bridge that we cross rivers with most of the time because, you see, we're deep into the Indian Reservation now. So it has one little bridge for your right wheels and one little bridge for your left wheels, so there's no railing and nothing in the middle. And so I kind of come down the muddy hill, bump up onto this little bridge, and I'm like, oh, and I go across. Then on the other side, I have to hoof it to get up the muddy hill on the other side. So I'm like, you know, second gear, drop the clutch, what? up the muddy hill on the other end. The whole time you're going, this is a bad idea, but I'm only eight miles away. I should turn around, but I'm only seven miles away. I'm going to just see what it would look like. I'd stop and look on the computer and the laptop next to me. How long would it take to get around? Five hours to drive around to the other side. I'm only four miles away. I'm just going to keep going. I go by, and there's like a Jeep full of awesome Native American guys, and they're just laughing at the white dude in a blue Ford <laughs> going through the woods, right? I have no business in this place. And they're just laughing at me. And I'm just like, hi, guys. <laughs> I just keep driving my little Ford Escort. And I'm cruising. And now it's like jungle. I don't know if you know this, but there is a temperate rainforest on the Pacific coast of Washington State. It is every bit as rainforest as all the pictures, except it's called a temperate one. So it's not jungly, but it's every bit as completely green and trees and everything everywhere. You, miss, you got everything but monkeys. You know, like everything's there. And so I'm going, and the road keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Finally, I get to one mile from this destination that I'm supposed to be at. I've gone 11 miles, and the road just dead ends. I get out of the car, and I'm frustrated. It's five hours to go around. I've gone through this 11 miles I shouldn't have gone through. I'm in this Ford Escort. I don't know if it'll get out. I've been out of cell phone coverage for an hour and a half by this point. And so what am I going to do? So, oh, there's a footpath. Well, what is up there? So I walk this footpath. It's probably more of a game trail <laughs> up to the edge here. And there was what used to be a bridge that probably fell in 40 or 50 years ago going across and a huge river coming from my right, going to my left, emptying into the Pacific Ocean. I'm at the end of the road. There is nowhere to go but backwards because I was impatient. You ever been impatient? What did I do? I turned that escort around, and I didn't want to be stuck anymore, so I just hauled out of there as fast as I could. And actually, I got about two miles away from the end of the road there, and I ran into another guy with a truck, and I said, do you know a better way out of here? And he goes, follow me! And then he was driving like 55, 60 miles an hour down through these roads. <laughs> I was just trying to keep up. It was crazy. But yeah, so we had, you know, we had this type of thing. There was another time where we, we had our fifth wheel uh, trailer and my truck had just not wanted to start at the end, at, you know, on the way home. And we were like a, a couple miles from home. Some nice guy who had a big truck like mine has a fifth wheel on it, right? He says, oh, I'll just hook up to my truck and tow it home for you. Save you a tow fee. I'm like, you're a super nice guy. Thanks. He hooks it up. He's driving. He's a reasonably good driver. And I'm sitting in the shotgun position. And I said, we have to go this way because of the weird angle to get into my driveway. Okay. And, and I said, okay, slow down, slow down. And he doesn't slow down in time to get into my driveway. So I said, oh, you passed it. We're going to have to go turn around. No, I'll just back up. We're on a state highway. So he backs up, looks in his mirrors, doesn't see anything, and then poof, backs into a Volkswagen that was right up on the bumper of my fifth wheel. Then he panics and puts it back into forward gear and starts to turn into my driveway and in the process drags the entire driver's side of the RV along the neighbor's fence post taking out my neighbor's fence, taking out the driver's side of the RV, $14,000 in damage to that RV. And the Volkswagen. I don't know how much that was, but that was a new Volkswagen that got smashed by the... Anyway. Patience is something that all of us lose from time to time. And um, I've been known to have a little impatience, and I've tried through some of 
learning from some of these experiences not to lose patience so much, but sometimes we lose patience at work with a family member. You lose patience when you've got a child away from God with a spouse that's not yet a Christian, when you're in a challenging situation. You lose patience with those who maybe make unwise decisions or maybe you make your own unwise decisions. Proverbs 16.32 is your memory verse for today. It says this, better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. Read that with me now. Let's say, better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. Say it again, better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper better than a one that takes a city. It's better to be patient than angry, better to be patient than argumentative, better to be patient than a controlling fighter. And, you know, we have to, you guys ready to get into this? I bet you're, you can't even wait because you're so impatient. No. Anybody ever, anybody had your patience tested recently? You can be honest. Yep. I know I have. I remember when we moved <laughs> here, you know, there was a whole lot of things that required patience. Waiting for the truck to pick up our stuff, waiting for the truck to drop off our stuff. We had to put everything that we needed for a couple of weeks into our vehicles when we drove across the country to move to this place because, you know, we were not going to have the majority of our possessions for weeks. And so that was one of those things. And so we've had to, we tested our patients uh, with that. Um, but it could be that, you know, if there's somebody in your life specifically who is testing your patience and you might wonder, why won't she do the right thing? Why won't he apologize? Why doesn't my boss recognize my incredible talent and wonderful good looks? Why do I put up with this, right? We have to remember in these situations when our patience is tested, we have to remember better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. The New Testament complements this idea. It's not just Old Testament. Surprise, surprise. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 13. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Ouch. But what about the ones I don't like? Be patient with everyone. But what about the ones who are just taking their sweet old time and don't care about what my timeline and what I'm trying to do here? Be patient with everyone. Wait. Everyone? Yeah, everyone. I didn't make it up. It's in the book. Verse 15, make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Better a patient man than a fighter. Why? Why is patience better than a fighter? Well, a patient person can help heal broken relationships. Proverbs 15, 18 says, a hot-tempered man stirs up dissension, but a patient man calms a quarrel. A patient man calms a quarrel. I think about Joseph in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, when his brother sold him into slavery and, you know, he got caught in all kinds of terrible situations. Twice he was jailed wrongly. And where everybody else might be tempted to say, well, I guess this is it for me and I guess the plan is over. He was patient to allow God to, to deal with him. Joseph waited and Joseph forgave. He had to forgive his brothers who betrayed him and sold him into slavery. He had to wait and forgive those who wrongly accused him and put him into prison. And what the enemy meant for evil, God used for good. Isn't that true? I grew up kind of a fighter. Some of you probably have as well. I'm not the most patient person in traffic. What I do know is this, is that if someone is going too slow in front of me, clearly they're too slow and I'm right. But if I'm going a little slow and someone's riding my tail, they're going too fast because I'm right, right? Isn't Anybody else like that? Man, I can't believe these people that go by so fast. What a jerk. Oh, these other people that go, they're always riding my tail and flashing their high beams at me. What a jerk. Um, but, you know, that's, I, I, I might, some of us have a predisposition to getting mad in traffic. I remember this one time when the kids were younger and we were a small enough family to have a minivan. <laughs> some of you are like, once we have enough kids, we'll get a minivan. We've already gone past the minivan stage. We went sedan to minivan to suburban, and we finally outgrew suburbans. Now it's like the 15-passenger van. Yeah, we got that big transit going on out there. Don't be jealous of our vehicle selection. It is a sweet ride. I'm happy to report. But we were in a minivan, and some guy cut us off in traffic. And, man, I was so mad, I was reaching for my buckle to unbuckle. And he gets out. Oh, this is escalating quickly. And Christina calmly says, 
you need to calm down and be patient. And like her voice calmed me down. It was exactly what I needed to hear at the time. You know, it's like a friend talking you off the edge when you're about to do something dumb. It takes patience. She was patient with me, and her patience rubbed off on me. You know, sometimes if, if, you know, if your marriage is on the rocks, being patient with one another, allowing each other the time that it takes to find healing and the time that it takes to find restoration within your relationship, it's worth it to be patient and to give it time. Refusing to make ultimatums. If you don't do X, Y, Z by this date, it's over. That's an ultimatum. And what that does is it tells the enemy exactly what has to happen in order to break up your marriage. Ultimatums like that are stupid. Don't do it. Are you with me? And through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, Proverbs 25, 15 says. Through patience, God can change a heart and heal a broken relationship. Because you see, it sometimes... You know, the Bible talks about how a nagging wife, it's better to be stuck on the corner of a rooftop than with a, in the house with a nagging wife. And there's lots of other things about us guys, too, that are really, really annoying to put up with. Aren't, aren't, isn't that true? But if we give each other patience instead of nagging and constantly correcting each other and all that kind of stuff, we learn to be patient with one another. We remove the tension from the situation. Someone needs to hear that. Another reason, you know, the, so, so patience is better because a patient person can help heal a broken relationship, but also a patient person gives God time to work. See, now God doesn't actually need time. God can do things whenever he wants to, but God is being patient with us. And so sometimes we have to give God the ability to work with everybody else. Our patience uh, sort of extends through, through that. Psalm twenty-seven, fourteen: wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. It says it twice in one verse. Do you think you should wait for the Lord? Yeah. yeah, probably a good word. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Sometimes we got to wait for the Lord. That's just something that we got to do. I'm glad that Jesus didn't give up on people. I'm glad that Jesus was patient and didn't give up. He didn't write off the woman that he met at the well because of his immoral life. He knew exactly what she was going through and where she had been and what she had done. Oh, you had five husbands, and the guy you're with now isn't even your husband. But he didn't give up on her. Instead, he called her to uh, repentance. And she tells everyone in her town about the experience that she had meeting Jesus. Jesus didn't give up on the tax collector Zacchaeus for his sins. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, though the short guy who climbed the tree to see him, and Jesus didn't give up on him. And he didn't ban Peter because of his denial when he denied him as Jesus was facing the cross. What I love about Jesus is that his example is one of patience towards us. But we often have a an attitude of impatience towards him. Why haven't you answered my prayer on my timeline? Why haven't you answered my prayer the way I would like it to be answered? Why haven't you shown up? Why didn't the Messiah show up the way we always believed he would in the Old Testament? We thought he was going to be a king or the president of the United States or whatever. We thought he was coming as this great ruler. Instead, he comes as a baby in a manger <laughs> next, to, next to some sheep and cows. That's not the way we pictured it. But he's patient with us. He loved, he forgave, he waited on God to work. And over time, God changed all of these lives and more. I remember a friend of mine when I was a teenager, I was contending for him to get saved, and he was dabbling in the occult at the time. And, you know, when he finally got saved, I remember it had been such a battle, such a hard-fought battle, that I remember having this thought. I was at the ripe old age of 15 or 16. Okay, Lord, he got saved. Now you can take me. <laughs> I didn't have this understanding that, that the Lord might have more things to do. And instead, I thought, oh, this is it. But it was a long time coming. And I remember losing patience with, with wondering, will he, ever, will he ever turn around? Will he ever get saved? Will he ever find Jesus? But if there's one thing that kind of frustrated me with the churches I attended growing up, see if you relate to this. 
was how they expected a, a brand new Christian who had just received the Lord last week to suddenly like be some miracle, wonderful Christian this week. God transforms our life, but also God continually prunes the trees over years and years to continue to make us better. I'm thankful for his grace and for his patience. And that, that means that we now as believers have to give patience to the folks who are coming through these doors, understanding that not everybody who walks through these doors is going to be where you are. Not everyone's going to make the decisions that you would make. But, you know, I just want to say this out, you know, say this, that this is a part of a culture of our church that if you're not sure what you believe yet, it's okay for you to belong before you believe. It's okay for you to be here and to explore Jesus and to experience the presence of God as you figure out and wrestle with your salvation. Because our prayer is that if we get you into the presence of God long enough, once you meet him, you can't walk away. And so we've heard stories from people about bad experiences in church that have been like that. We just, we know we don't want to be that way. Are you with me? Because you know what? I don't have it all together and you don't either. But, but we can take comfort knowing that God is working in my life, that he who started a good work is faithful to complete it. And he's working in you also. And Sometimes we're looking for an instant win here, like microwave, zap fry something for 60 seconds, and it's ready to go. But, you know, that's just not how it often works, and it's a short-sighted thing. And, um, and so we, just, we don't want to be that way. And Romans 8.25 says, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. You know, Christina had no idea what I was going to be talking about today when she got up during worship and was telling you to, like, don't give up on God in the midst of waiting. And when you're going through, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff, she had no idea. This has been a fun experiment recently where she gets up and says something during worship that has to do with a message she has no idea that I've written. Because we're serving the same Holy Spirit who has the same thing to say to this body. All right, isn't that cool? Here's the thing about patience with waiting on God. I have to ask, I'm going to ask you this, and I'm asking myself too, is do we trust God at his word? If we're waiting on God to do something, can we be patient enough to allow him to actually accomplish it? Or are we going to be impatient and suddenly just come to a point where we just decide, well, I guess he's not going to do it? You know, do we have faith that he will do it, even when it seems like it maybe it's too late? I think about the way that Jesus responded to his friend Lazarus. Hey, Lazarus, your friend is sick. And he didn't just get up right away and say, well, I'm Jesus, I'll go heal the guy. It says that he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he went to see his friend Lazarus. And by the time he gets there, it's too late, Lord, he's dead. See, there's, there's a whole lot of patience going on there. You go, if... if you know, is this, is this a thing where we still think that God can do it even when it's too late? What if it's too slow? What if it's no? What if the answer doesn't come the way you want it to come? Will you still follow God? Christina shared a testimony about her dad. And that was a question that many of the family had to wrestle with. We didn't get the miracle we hoped for. We didn't get the miracle that we prayed for. Do we still trust God in all things? You see, the timing of God is perfect. And, and, and we don't always understand that from his perspective, but we have to trust that he has his perspective. I remember praying with him in the hospital room, and we would pray for very specific things. Lord, we pray that the oxygen gets to this level, and it would. We pray that the heart rate would get to this level, and it would. And it felt like the Lord was telling us, he says, I want you to know that I'm hearing your prayer. And I want you to know I'm going a different direction anyway. And is that something I'm okay with or is it something that I'm not? You see, we got a call yesterday that a close family friend of ours was found dead in his home. And about 10 years prior, his wife had died of cancer. Um, and he was so angry at God. Part of the concern my sisters have is, did he ever make it right with God or did he die mad at God because the outcome 
wasn't what he hoped for, wasn't what he expected for. Instead of saying, I can be in a place of trusting God and patience in every situation, he got into a place of holding a grudge. And that root of bitterness has ruined his life over the last many years. That's just something that we don't want to get to, is it? So there is patience that we need to have as believers. And there's a lot of times where you hear these ideas of, you know, surrender your life to Jesus and your whole life turns, turns around and it's so much better. It's like it is better net positive, yes, but it doesn't mean you're not going to go through hard times and hard moments. In fact, there's likely to be an increase of it because when you're not following the Lord, you're no threat to the kingdom of darkness. Once you start following the Lord and actually taking him at his word, you become a threat to the darkness. And so in that, in, that, in that case, it ends up being that sometimes us as believers, we end up with a target on our back from an enemy that hates you and wants you to have the same fate that he has. Let me address this concern. A lot of people say, why would God send people to hell? You know that God doesn't send people to hell. Hell is made for the, the enemy. God, in, God made heaven for you. But the enemy in his anger is doing everything he can to take collateral damage with him. Like a terrorist who wears a bomb, he just wants to try to blow up everybody he can on his way out. And so we have to understand, because if we have this wrong perspective on the goodness of God, we often will misappropriate, uh, you know, who's to blame for a situation. Are you with me? When you're a new believer, it seems like the Lord steps up to a faith response right away. I don't know if you've seen this before. You ever seen, like, some of you who are new believers where you've given your life to the Lord, and it's just like you pray, and the answer comes right now. Have you seen that? You know, and having been a believer for many years now, it's like I love seeing a brand new believer come to the Lord, and they pray, and God does it, and they pray, and God does it, and they pray, and God does it. It's interesting to me how more mature believers, it's not always so instant it's not so zap fry 60 seconds in the microwave because what God is helping us to do as we mature in the faith is to also start to develop in areas like patience, to start to develop tenacity, to start to develop a faith that continues even when the situation looks bleak because God is looking for mature believers to have a maturity enough that says we don't give up when the situation looks rough. It's like when a child is first doing, you know, some reading or something like that, and even though they messed up half of the sentence, you still say, good job, you got half of them right. But as they get older and their reading gets better, and it's, you know, 15 words in a sentence, and you say, oh, you, you misspelled this one word. You got these two letters transposed. I'm going to mark you down. You get minus one point for that. Well, why are you being so hard on me? Why are you being so critical? Because you are now growing to a point where we expect more out of you. You see, you're no longer like a child. You no longer have think like a child and reason like a child. Now, now you're grown, and, and it's time to have faith like a grown person and to reason like a grown person and to be somebody who has a spine and some fortitude to stand up in the midst of a storm and to tell the storm peace, be still. We, we read in the book of Daniel... How, how he had prayed for something and there was a war in the heavenlies between angels and demons for 21 days. You see, Daniel prayed and the answer was yes, right away. The answer was yes, but the Lord sent a messenger that took 21 days to arrive. What if Daniel gave up on day 18? Most of us would give up on day two because we're so used to zap fry instant pop tart culture and we're holding God up to that standard as well. Instead of saying, I'm going to trust the Lord in all circumstances, be the answer yes or no or maybe or not yet. God is still good and he is still God and he's still in charge and I'm still his and it's no longer me that lives but him who lives in me. Better a patient man than a warrior. Better to be patient than an angry fighter. Be, wh why? Because God will help heal a broken relationship. Why? Because it gives God time to work. And why? Because God is patient with us. 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 8 and 9, says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
I mean, how many times he said, oh, Lord, come now. Come, come back right now, Lord. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. And, and while that might be really nice for those of us who know the Lord, it's really not nice for those who are about to repent next week. And thank God that he was patient to, enough to wait for you to meet him. Shouldn't we wait? Shouldn't we pray that he tarries longer so that we can talk to more people, so that more people can get to know who Jesus is and what he can do for them? What, did it, what, what a hypocrisy it is to say, well, I got mine. Take me, Lord, take me now. Instead of saying, I got mine use me to help them get theirs man isn't it so good that God is patient with you and with me and the good news is that he's patient with us some of us may have been characterized as somebody who is impatient I know that's me some of us may be making bad decisions I know I have but God has been patient with me and he's patient with you too Every opportunity that God gives us comes with a used by date just like the cottage cheese in your fridge that used to be milk I poured some cream in my coffee right out of the fridge here. And even though the expiration date said October, it came out chunky. I did not proceed to chew my coffee and think that that was a good idea. I dumped it out in the kitchen sink in there and I poured a fresh cup and I opened up a fresh tub of cream because I did not want chunky cream in my coffee today. Every opportunity that God gives us comes with a used by date. I have this really great invention idea, and I want, uh, some of you, we should go into business together. And I'm going to say it. It's on the internet. Uh, but I'm like, you know how like, you have a jug and it says fresh milk or fresh cream? But even after it's expired, it still says fresh on the outside. What if the label changed as it wasn't fresh anymore? Like the word not appears over. It's like got a, a timed ink or something, and over time, just the ink just starts to be not fresh cream, not fresh cottage cheese. So if, you, if you're an investor, let's go into business. Let's do that. God gives us opportunities, and he's patient with us as we go through these opportunities. But if we don't seize the moment and seize the opportunity, we miss out on that opportunity. We're given this life, and what we do here determines what happens next? And like my friend who passed away this week, we don't know when this opportunity expires. So it's important that we seize this moment because God is being patient with us. And for some of you, it's time to say, I need to repent and turn to the Lord today. For some of you, you might be saying it's time to come to God. God has been calling you. He's been calling your name. You've been seeing how the Lord keeps seeming to speak to you through the circumstances going on in your life. You see a sign when you're driving down the road. You hear somebody say something when you're at work. Uh, you're just out in public and the cash register chings in a certain way that reminds you of a certain memory. I believe that is a specific thing for somebody. God is calling you to come back to him today. I want to talk to you prodigals. It's time to come home. Your father loves you. Your father is waiting for you. Your father is not mad at you. Your father is ready to give you the robe and to put on the ring and to kill the fattened calf and to throw a celebration because he loves you. The father looks at the horizon and he says, when will my beloved come home? I have every resource here. But like the prodigal, we go and we go off into our own little world thinking we know best until we finally wake up and realize these pigs are eating better than I am. Maybe if I go home, I can ask my father to treat me like the hired help. But your father is so good. He says, no, you're not the hired help. You're my son. You're my daughter. And I love you. I'm here to give you everything and to lavish it upon you. I've been waiting for your return. I've been waiting patiently for you to come back to me. Come and be with me. You know that this is what God wants. The story of the rich young ruler. A lot of people, I think, 
get a little sidetracked by the stuff the rich young ruler has, but the crux of the thing is the rich young ruler asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? He says, well, follow all the laws and the prophets. Well, I've been doing this stuff since I was a boy. What must I do? Well, if you really want to be pure, sell all your stuff and be with me. And we think that it's all about the stuff. And I think it's not that stuff is bad. It's if stuff has you. And because the stuff had him, he walks away sad. But we're in this position where we can look now through the eyes of history. And we can see what he says to him. Get rid of the stuff. Step one. Step two is the punchline. Be with me. Be with me. Be with me. And yet we sit and we think, well, I'm not good enough. I don't have the right behavior. Uh, My my marriage is not in the right place. And just uh, all this other stuff, it's just not right. It's not right. Maybe when I get right, maybe I'll come back to the Lord. You miss what he's saying. He's less concerned with how you look and what you did last night. He's more concerned with be with me. Prodigal, come home. God is waiting for you, and his patience is here now. Do it while you have the chance. If you're online right now, come on, just type out there. Just say, I'm coming back to the Lord right now. Come on, let us know. If, if you want prayer for something, please text the church. Let us know that how we can pray for you. I just want to talk to in this. If you're in the room, get this number. If you're watching online, get this number, 507-200-8357. Text us a prayer request. Say, please pray for me. 507-200-8357. We want to pray with you. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Ecclesiastes 7, 8 says. I'm going to read that again. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Jesus, I thank you for every one of these incredible people who are here in person and online. Lord, I thank you that you're so patient with us. God, let none of us today walk away from the opportunity that we have to repent before you today. I thank you, Lord, that you are a good, good father who loves us more than we could ever understand or fathom or imagine. God, I thank you, Lord, that you give more than enough grace, God, that if we would come to you, Lord, that if we would look to you and say, be my leader and be my Lord, God, there you are, God, ready to give the gifts that are befitting to a son or daughter of the King of kings and of the Lord of lords. And so we receive that free gift of salvation from you today in Jesus' name. If you're in this place and you're saying, I need to repent today, I need to turn back to the Lord, and I'm done with this prodigal living. I'm done with this today. Today is a day that's a demarcation. It's a line in the sand. Today is a day of definition, and it's a day of decision for me. Would you let me know? Raise your hand. Today is a day of decision for me. I'm a prodigal returning home to the daddy. Come on. Let me know if that's you today. And I'll indicate that online in the comments as well. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, God, and we thank you for God for every heart that turns towards you today in Jesus' name. God, we give ourselves to you, and we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, everyone. Just want to be up here. Don't forget Tuesdays. This Tuesday, we're going to start we're going to start Bible study, and we're going to start crafting group. And then ladies' night is on Friday. And right now, if you guys need prayer for anything, go ahead and come on up. We'll have our prayer team waiting for you. You guys have a great week. Thank you. <laughs>